Good morning, guys. Good morning. Yeah. Beautiful day. Y'all get to sit underneath those new curtains. You're not boiling hot this morning. Isn't that great? Um, some of you might not even notice, but if you sit on this side, you don't notice very much. But uh, I'm going to pray one more time because prayer is good and we all need it, right? Okay. Let's pray together. Father God, uh, wow, Lord, we come to you on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, come together as friends, as family, as brothers and sisters in Christ, believers and non-believers. You know, Lord, it's you brought whom you brought, and we just pray, Lord, that you open up our hearts and our minds to your word this morning, that it let it be an encouragement to us. We thank you for all the many great blessings that you give to us that we get to experience Lord, and that we can come before you, uh, that we come, come before you in prayer. And it's one of the greatest gifts you've been able to give us, that we don't have to go through any person to stand before you. Thank you, Lord, and thank you for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we've been going through Philippians, and it is my great honor to be able to preach on Philippians 4. One of my favorite passages, as I'm sure it is for many of you. Uh, We've heard this, and one of my concerns for preparing this was, um, and I I mentioned it to a couple people, was uh, I knew this passage so well that I was concerned that it it would come across as flippant, that it would just be something, oh, okay, you know, we've all heard this, be anxious for nothing, and Prayer and supplication, thanksgiving, let your request be known to God and peace of God. You know, we've, we've heard these pa- this passage many times before. And, and oftentimes when you're looking, when something is going on in your life and circumstances are causing you to be a little, you know, wary of things and anxious and scared and nervous, uh, you do that quick concordance look for anxiety or anxious or fear. And you come you come across to these verses and it's a great encouragement to us it makes us feel better but we want to look at this and we want to be want to we don't want to just glance over it and we don't want to just take it for granted because familiarity can breed you know just ignorance of it so let's read the passage together um matt finished with uh philippians 4 1 so we're going to start in philippians 4 2 uh, and if you guys want to turn to Philippians 4.2 and read with me, uh, that'd be great. Uh, and I practiced these names in the beginning for a lot of times, and now I'm probably going to butcher them again. But uh, I urge you, Udiah and Sintiki, Sint- oh man, what is it again, Eli? Sintiki, thank you. To live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have, strugg- who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Uh, I I want us to think about a few things, and we'll come back to this passage here in a moment, but... um, Many of you know that I used to work for a residential treatment facility for at-risk youth. Uh, worked, I worked alongside, I was, a, I was a youth counselor. I was educated by these, uh, by these therapists who I worked with on how to work with these, uh, these kids who had some pretty uh, su- substantial trauma in their life um, and how to kind of reevaluate and, and readjust this mentality that they had and this entitlement and a bunch of things. And one of the ways that we did this is there had to be consequences for actions. Uh, and we, we refer to them, though, as not being like a negative, I'm going to take this away from you, but as natural consequences. That when they behaved, you know, against the rules, they broke the rules, then the natural consequence was that they lost privileges, something was taken from them. But likewise, we, we, we stress that there was natural consequences to 
uh, acting according to the rules. That when you acted according to the rules, then you got privileges. You got to go out into the community and, and play on a playground. You got to do those things as long as, as long as you were following the rules. But the thing is, is these kids could sometimes manipulate the system, right? They could act according to the rules when they wanted to and act and break the rules when they didn't want to and they were willing to sacrifice whatever the privilege was. So instead, it came down to uh, this idea of right thinking versus wrong thinking. Right thinking produced right results, and wrong thinking produced wrong results. These kids had it in their head uh, that if the world is out to get me, um, I'm entitled to this, uh, the world's been unfair to me, I didn't make the choices, the world dealt me a bad hand, therefore I get this. And when things were taken away from them, it was never their fault. Wrong thinking produced wrong results. So we, we worked with them to explain, you know, when you, when you think about things as they really are, as, as, they truly, you know, as they truly are, then it starts, it starts to make more sense. You start to make the right choices, not because you have to, because they're the rules, but because it makes the most amount of sense for your own life. Our parents do that with us when we're growing up, right? They tell us, they teach us, you know, right from wrong, hopefully. You know, they teach us that if you do these things right, then these right things Will happen you get those privileges as well you know if you get good grades or if you don't skip school or if you don't do this then you get to go hang out with your friends you get to do whatever you know whatever those privileges might be but uh, or when you're really little uh, they teach you don't do these things because something bad's going to happen to you you know if when you when you're really little you know maybe you know Heidi and Jason are teaching Reagan when she gets a little bit taller don't touch the stove because it's going to be hot you know you're going to burn yourself is that on the parents? Is that, is that for the parents' benefit? <laughs> well, maybe, because then they don't have to bandage up a burnt hand. But, you know, it's for, out of concern for the child, because you don't want to do this. But if the child gets to a point, they think, my parents just, you know, they don't care. They, they don't really care. They just want to stop me from having fun. That's wrong thinking, and it's going to produce a wrong result. They're going to touch the stove. They're going to fly too close to the sun, and they're going to burn up. Well, when we're... Uh, so as people desiring to follow Christ, we also need guidance, right? Because we either just don't know or we think we know better than either our parents, our pastors, our teachers, our mentors, or God himself. We think we just know better. And we start to see this because we see this in Paul gives advice to the Philippians uh, in, in Philippians 4. The Philippians are having this issue, right? We've, we've read up until this point, these Philippians are Christians. They're having issues. They're being persecuted. They're struggling. There are circumstances that are surrounding them that are not fun. And maybe they don't understand what's going on. And Paul seeks to you know, clarify on how to survive these circumstances, how to benefit from them, how to get through them without a bitterness towards God or each other. So he starts off in, in, in Philippians 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, that your request be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Often Christians fall into a groove of rule following, going through the motions, checking things off a list. Pray, read, attend church, like it's a favor to God. It's like, okay, I checked it off, God. I went to church this week. Okay, God, I read my Bible three out of seven days this week. Okay, God, I prayed before I went to bed last night, or I prayed before that test, or I prayed before that job interview, so now I'm entitled to whatever it is I asked for, or whatever it is I'm hoping for, or whatever this is. Wrong, wrong thinking producing wrong results, right? Right? We start to think that our service to God, our attendance at church, or our reading and praying is a, somehow a favor to God, that he somehow is lucky that we do these things. Almost like the child who thinks that the parent wants them to, you know, not to touch the stove because they just want to stop me from having fun. You know, whatever, mom and dad, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to touch it anyway. Wrong thinking produces wrong results. This is why it's hard for us, uh, and we can become anxious, like the Philippians. When we, when we do these things, we, we see it there, and we are concerned about what God's going to do for us. 
And when, when we do this, then, then when God doesn't respond the way we think he should, or we get bit by it, we get burned by the stove, then somehow it's God's fault. Why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you explain it to me? Why didn't you tell me? Well, Paul is telling them, hey, this is your advice. You don't want to get burned. Here's why. Don't, don't touch the stove. Don't be anxious. Thanks, Paul. Don't be anxious. Be anxious for nothing. But how am I supposed to be anxious for nothing? I just want the peace of God. I don't want to work for this. I'm a Christian already, right? He's talking to believers. I should have the peace of God. Be anxious for nothing. Peace of God. Come on, Paul. What's going on? Why are you telling me this? How am I supposed to? But be anxious for nothing. It's not a spiritual check mark. You don't just get to go through the day and be like, I wasn't anxious today. Check. I met, I, I met some obligation towards God. And you know what, God? You're lucky. You're lucky I wasn't. Now give me my piece of, now give me that piece. We were told what to do by Paul. We were told how to do it. And we're told why to do it. That's what, that's what six, and, 6 and 7 has to do. Be anxious for nothing. That's the what to do. Uh, the why is, in the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and mind Jesus. Great. That is the why. But what's the how? Well, the how is by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And we glance over this because we get going through those motions, like I mentioned before, we get going through these motions where my prayer to God is, an, is an, either an obligation for me, it's a check mark, or it's some sort of favor to God that I came to you and talked to you, God, therefore I'm entitled to this. But the thing is, is it's wrong thinking. We want to we look at this in a different way. We want to look at this as the, as the way God really intended it to be. Be anxious for nothing. Why? To experience the peace of God. How important, uh, the how is important. Not as a favor to God, but because it is good and healthy and right. See, again, going back to our analogy of telling a, telling a child not to touch the stove, the parent doesn't get anything out of this. It doesn't, they don't get anything except for protecting the child. It's good and healthy and right for the child not to touch the stove. They'll get hurt otherwise. And if we don't pray and if, with, with supplication and thanksgiving, if we don't go to God sincerely and honestly as, as, a, as a means, then we, are ex, then we are expecting something completely wrong here. If we don't do this, then how can we expect anything? Or how can we, yeah, I don't know. If we read what Paul says in verses 6 and 7 without the how, we have be anxious for nothing and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and mind Jesus. That's a command. It's a command. Be anxious for nothing and then you will have peace. If you do this, then you get this. Be anxious for nothing doesn't do anything. You can't just tell someone to stop being anxious. And, and Paul, seeking to be the good steward of his word and to be a good parent leading these children, in a sense, he is giving them the right advice, saying, it, be anxious for nothing through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. This is what's important. The how is the means, the advice. And it's important. But... Paul can be well-meaning and a parent can be well-meaning and can give some good advice that seems right, makes sense. How many of you guys have ever been given bad advice? Yeah? <laughs> Raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> Every, we've all been given bad advice, right? We didn't consider the source, did we? Not always. Sometimes people just repeat what they hear. They think it works. They think it's good. And it doesn't actually amount to anything. So then if we're going to be good stewards of the advice that Paul has given us, then we need to evaluate the advice before we necessarily follow it, correct? That's what we should do. That's what we should do with our friends, our family, our loved ones who have all the best intentions of the world, but maybe not necessarily the greatest source. Well, what's Paul's source? Paul doesn't say, hey, rejoice in me, 
Paul and be anxious for nothing. He doesn't say, be anxious in yourselves. In fact, you know, the last, few, last couple weeks, we, got, we went through Philippians chapter 3, and Paul did a very excellent job of explaining why he can't trust in himself. If I trust in myself, I have a lot to be anxious about. There's a lot of anxiety when I try to do it. Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving doesn't matter if the source is impotent. If there's no power there. If there's no substance there, then it doesn't make any difference. If I trust someone that I just meet on the street, there's no substance there. I have no idea if they have my best intention in, in mind. I don't know if they're right or wrong. We subject ourselves to advice and teachings from a lot of people all the time. And how many times do we question it? Very rarely in my experience do we do that. So I, I, I want to challenge us to not just be a, uh, just to eat it up. I don't want to challenge us to just take, especially not my word for it, but he, or even Paul's word for it, but to, but to consider the source. Consider who this is coming from, really, and who Paul is really saying is the source of the peace. You know, it's, it's funny because, uh, you know, the music team did, uh, did uh, uh, the song there, uh, what is it, Holy Holy, or what is it, the song there, the Prince of Peace one, um, I forget what the name of it is, but it's funny because uh, I, I preached back in December, and we actually did that song that, that week as well. I was like, okay, so prepare, I'm pre preaching again next week, so uh, prepare, we might have it again, but... I love this song, and so it was so, it was so appropriate because I, I love this song, and, it, and one of the fa best lines in there is, you're my prince of peace. Who is it, who's our prince of peace? It's not Paul. It's not our parents. It's not us. It's Christ. That's the source. Verses 4 and 5, they describe the source. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say Rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Why? Okay, rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because he's near. That's why rejoice in the Lord. He's close to us. Okay, well, who's, you know, the Lord. Okay, he's Jesus. Awesome. 8 and 9 tells us a little bit more about the source. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, What? Dwell on these things. Dwell on these things. That's what's cool here, because we, if we go back to the beginning where we talked about right thinking versus wrong thinking, if, we, if, if right thinking produces right results or right behavior, right choices, and wrong thinking produces the wrong choices, then how do we make the right choices? Well, we dwell on the things that help us think right. We dwell on the person who actually has the power to change things who has the ability to do the things that Paul claims, the things that we need. We dwell on the things of Christ. So I urge you, if you need and want the peace of God, then consider the source. A while back, we did one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite lessons, one of my favorite series I've ever done with, uh, with youth, um, and I based it on, uh, I based, I, <laughs> wordplay, it was, it was funny, I based it off of the, the trilogy, the, uh, the Bourne trilogy, you guys know with Matt Damon, Jason Bourne, okay, it's, it's a great action, action movie, um, but we decided Bourne Again was the title of the series, okay, but instead of it being Jason Bourne, it was Bourne, B-O-R-N, right? And I, but I based each of the next three weeks off of the original trilogy. It was the Bourne Identity. It was the Bourne Supremacy and the Bourne Ultimatum. The first one was the, was, was the Bourne Identity. And instead of, we could have talked about, you know, the, the identity of the believer in Christ. We could have done that, but we didn't. We went a different direction. And we went on the identity of Christ. See, there's a lot of Christs in the world, isn't there? There's a ton of them. Almost every world religion has some sort of teaching or belief about it, or about who he is. 
You know, if you were to talk to a Muslim, he was a prophet. He was a prophet of the Lord. He was, a good, he was, he was awesome. He was, he was venerated. He was, he was revered. He was, he was important. Not as important as some others, but he was important. You know? If you talk to, uh, if you talk to uh, some, some uh, teachings of Judaism, he was a great teacher. He was, he, was a, he was a good teacher. He was a rabbi. Okay? If you talk to, even, even among denominations of, you know, of this overarching denominations of Christianity, you get things that are different. Jehovah Witness believe that this is, they teach that Jesus was uh, the same as uh, Michael the Archangel. Um, and in our context here in, uh, in Utah, we get that Christ is the brother, the, the spirit brother of Lucifer in Mormonism. Everybody's got a different identity for Christ. And that changes who the source is then, doesn't it? So when you're considering where it's coming from and who you're seeking peace from God from, ask the question, who it is? What's the source? Christ, Christ is who he is, right? There's no changing that. And only one Jesus has the ability to be able to give the peace of God, to give salvation. And that is the, the, the Jesus of the Bible. When you're in a tough spot like the Philippians, well, hopefully not as tough as they were, I hope, I hope that you'll consider who and what you're putting, or you're, you're, you're drawing peace from, or you're seeking peace from. Because if you're seeking it from yourself, well, your anxiety is just going to increase. If you're seeking it from someone else, from a boyfriend or a girlfriend, a wife or a child, a, a teacher, a pastor, you're going to be anxious. And if you draw it from a Savior who's impotent, and you're going to be anxious. So the question comes down to how do, how do you and I receive the peace of God? How do you and I receive that? How do we receive this peace that is surpassing all comprehension? How do we receive that? Paul, how do we receive it? When the, when the, when the scripture writers, when they talk about things, when they explain things, they don't just say, do this, good luck. Figure it out. No, they don't do that. Verse 4, Paul tells us, rejoice in the Lord. If you rejoice in the Lord Jesus, that's one way. Verse 6, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. That's another way. Come before Christ. Come before him and pray to him. Ask him for peace with supplication and thanksgiving. And then one of my favorite parts of this is verse, his, end of verse 8. Dwell on these things. See, I asked, I asked uh, uh, well, Danielle and Jordan in Sunday school this morning, um, I, asked, you know, I asked them to think about... Uh, to you know, dwelling on things and how uh, that changes things. If you were to dwell on yourself and what makes you happy and what you think uh, validates your life, and then someone comes and attacks that with some sort of you know verbal abuse or whatever, what is going to be your reaction? Probably, probably anger for one. If someone invalidates it, probably anxiety, probably fear. Are they right? Is my self-worth dependent upon me? And if I'm not worth something, then there goes my whole philosophy in life. There goes my whole support system, and it just crumbles beneath me. But if we dwell on the things of Christ, if we dwell on the good things that he is, that he has done, who he is, and as Paul writes, what is honorable and right, pure, lovely, 
of good repute, excellence in anything worthy of praise, if we dwell on those things, what do you think the response to the person who is attacking you is going to be? Can they invalidate that? My answer would be no. So if we dwell on him, it produces a right reaction. Christ told us not to revile those who revile us, but to turn the other cheek. He didn't do it. He didn't do it when he was being cursed at. His, his, his dwelling, where his thoughts were, were on God, were on his Father, were on the things and the work that he was doing. That's where his dwelling thoughts were. And so for us, if our dwelling thoughts are on those things of Christ, then we too can suffer anything. We can move past being anxious for everything I move to being anxious for nothing. Now, it's not a perfect science, right? Humans aren't perfect. And this isn't like, this isn't a command where you, you, if, you don't, if you walk out of here and you start feeling anxious for something this afternoon, then you fail. You fail and God's not going to give you peace anymore because you're a sinner. No, that doesn't make sense, right? No, to rejoice in him to pray to him, to dwell on him. If if, If that's the goal, if that's the charge, if that's where we're walking to, that's what we're dwelling on, then it becomes much easier to respond to circumstances in a Christ like way. If Christ is at the forefront of our minds, then the next time circumstances take a dip, Health issues arise in yourself or loved ones. Job issues arise. Injuries happen. Or even, you know, things like, how am I going to pay for rent next month? We can respond to those things very easily. The human response is to respond with anxiety and fear and uncertainty. But Christ teaches us a different way, and Paul advises us to do so differently. But lastly, uh, in verse 9 is the last bit we haven't covered. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul says to do things you have heard and seen in me. See, here here comes to be part of the application. Paul, again, in, verse, in chapter 3, was very clear that I am not perfect and I have not, I have not attained it. I am not Christ. I am not perfect in every way. And yet now he turns around and he says, here, these things that you have seen in me, practice these things. Not belittling anything that Christ does or to say, follow Christ or follow me instead of following Christ. But there is something here like he, he again he's not perfect but it, it was visible in him the things that Christ taught him the things that he learned from others the things that God had shown him through through scripture they were evident in his life and they were visible to those around him we've been studying the book of acts for several weeks now and again we you know we talked about this morning we talked about uh, I, I don't know if we got off from the other sun, uh, Sunday school, but we were in chapter 23 today, and uh, it was a super high-profile, you know, case. Paul is uh, has, has been, you know, been arrested, and he said, "I'm a Roman." Now he's going to stand before this Jewish count, Jewish council, and all eyes are on him. And then the Sanhedrin comes up with this plan to to kill him, or we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna kill him, and uh, the Roman centurion commander. By, decides he's going to transport him to Governor Felix and uh, with 270 soldiers for one man. It's a high-profile case, and so Paul was known. He was well-known. He was recognized, not because he was perfect, but because of what Christ had done in his life, because he had done this complete 180, and the rest of the world took notice. So let me encourage us to say that it doesn't require 
doesn't require being a high profile individual. It doesn't require being a perfect individual to practice these things. To have these things be visible to others, to demonstrate these to your children, to demonstrate these to the people around you, to your friends and family, to your church family. We want to encourage each other. We want to pray for each other. We want to acknowledge these things and what Christ is doing in each other's lives. So it can be visible in us as well. My hope for this passage, guys, my hope here is that we walk away with this idea that I don't have to pray. I don't have to come to church. I don't have to do these things in order to make God happy. I don't have to make God happy with my actions. God gives us tools to explore him, to know him, not as a favor to himself, but as a blessing to ourselves. As believers, we have that right to, to know God and to, and to love him, to have the peace of God through a close relationship with him. I always, I always tell people that when I'm, when I'm studying something to teach, that I always seem to get the most out of it than when I'm just reading on my own. There's, you know, a little higher stakes, I guess, so, so, so to speak. But there, there's a point in driving this home where I want our reaction to circumstances, no matter what they were, whether they be personal, whether they be a community circumstance like the Philippians, whether it's a national response that are tragedies, <clears throat> or the entire world, ones that still impact us even overseas. The world is going to have its circumstances. We are going to experience them. We are going to fall into them, and we are going to get through them. Not because I've got it all together. Not because I'm clever. Not because somehow I found the secret formula to cross my T's and dot my I's and just ride it out. No, circumstances are going to rock the boat. They're not always going to be fun. The Philippians sure knew this firsthand. But by prayer, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Draw close to him the source of our joy, the source of our salvation. Draw close to him. Dwell on the things of Christ and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Let me pray. Father God, we are so grateful again for your word. For the encouragement that it is to us that, that even this church that supported the Apostle Paul, even this church which was trying to do its best in serving you, Lord, still experienced circumstances that were out of its control. And Lord, that Paul took re recognized this church and, and advised them in a very real, applicable, and doable way, Lord, that if the problem is a lack of peace... In circumstances, Lord, then the solution is to draw closer to the source of peace. It makes total and utter sense. If we have a problem, then draw closer to the solution. We don't have to experiment and try a million different ways to get there, Lord. 
we are so thankful to you that your word here, God, gives us an explanation that can give us hope in the fact that as believers, we have you to fall back on. Thank you, Lord, for this message. Thank you, Lord, for these verses. Thank you, Lord, that we can always count on you. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen.